So I'd like to welcome you guys all to the 315 session on, that's called All Out for Uncle Sam Movement in Northern Utah during World War II. I am Sarah Singh. I will be your moderator today. I am currently the head of Special Collections at Weber State University. I have an MA in History from Utah State and an MLIS from San Jose State University. I have co-authored four books on Ogden and I, my research interests include the history of Ogden, 25th Street, women, and prostitution. So I'm going to introduce uh, the first two panelists. Lori Rams isn't going to be presenting today because I told her she couldn't because <laughs> she's been sick. I know. So for All Out for Uncle Sam, we have Michael Balif. Michael is an undergraduate student at Weber State University, majoring in history. His main area of focus, main areas of focus are social and public history. He is an employee, a wonderful employee of Special Collections. Um, he was heavily involved, as all my students were, in the development of our project All Out for Uncle Sam on World War II in Northern Utah. And then next to him is Elisa, uh, Elisa, Alyssa <laughs> Chafee. Um, she's currently also working in Special Collections at Weber State University. She has been involved with our oral history program and is also processing the archives of, or of Ogden High School. Um, she is currently pursuing a Bachelor's of Art in History with a minor of Public History. And then lastly, we have Anya Kitterman um, from Hill Air Force Base. Anya is currently the Cultural Resources Manager. Um, she has previously worked for the Spokane District Office of the BLM, the Six Rivers National Forest, and the Gold Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park. Uh, Ms. Kitterman received her education at Durham University, UK. Way to go, and Oxford University, UK. And then she came to Utah. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to kind of tell you guys a little bit about our World War II project that we did. Um, and before I do that, there are, excuse me, 10 postcards on the back table, all of, um, with images from our exhibit on World War II in Northern Utah. Feel free to take as many as you want. Um, we have lots of them, so I try to give them out to people. Um, this all sort of started about a year and a, well, oh, geez, more than that now, two years ago, um, when one of my major donors brought up his father's uh, military information, um, short, like immediately the day we were packing everything up to close down the library for renovation. And he had served in World War II in Africa. And the sons had asked me, what are you ever going to do with this stuff? And so we got to thinking, well, you know what, we'll probably do a small little display or something on World War II in Northern Utah and the effect it had. So we were under renovation for um, 18 months. During that time, I had no access to my collections. So what else do I have to do than research? So we started researching and seeing that World War II really um, changed Weber and Davis counties. Before then it was more agricultural and then all of a sudden you have this huge influx of federal money um, and really changed the landscape of the area. So we decided to embark on an exhibit and researching for an exhibit. So over the next 18 months um, while we were closed we ended up doing 62 oral history interviews, over half of those with veterans. Um, that lived in the local area and then the other half were people who lived or grew up in the area and we ended up compiling all this gained hundreds if not thousands of photographs diaries letters scrapbooks all kinds of things and created a huge exhibit that opened up at the Union Station um, in March of, of this year and actually covered the entire top floor of the Union Station in Ogden so you can imagine it was it would take people days to come and if they actually read through everything. Um, it's since been closed and moved to Weber State. It's in our library and will be up until December. So if you're ever up in Ogden and you want to come up to the campus and it's on all three floors of the library and it's open um, all the times the library is open. So it's an amazing um, exhibit that really highlights some of the things um, these are guys are going to talk about. So. I'm going to turn the time over to Alyssa and Michael now. Thank 
All right. So Alyssa and I were kind of doing a, like a tag team sort of uh, presentation here. Um, so I'm going to be going first um, and talking a little bit more about uh, immediately during the war, kind of the changes that were brought, um, focusing a lot more on some statistics that I found, um, which is information generally like that. And then Alyssa will talk about the staying power of World War II in Northern Utah and how it changed the face permanently. Um, so just look forward to that. Uh, so, as I'm, like I said, I'm going to focus on wartime immigration in northern Utah between the years 1942 and 1947. Um, I'm focusing on three specific areas, uh, civilian immigration, uh, military movement, and POW arrival. Um, and also tagged on with POW arrival will be a brief discussion on the Japanese internment camps that were located near northern Utah. Uh, so first of all, civilian immigration. So World War II was obviously a colossal effort. The United States was fighting on two major fronts. Uh, the Pacific and the European front, and the United States defense industry before the war was not very big. Um, and so with the cost left that was needed, uh, many new jobs were created, and several of these jobs were located in, in Utah. Um, over 40,000 jobs were created in, North, in Utah in general during the war, um, but the vast majority of these were around Hill Field. That place came to employ 15,000 civilians alone during the height of the war, so that's a large percentage. This isn't counting the civilians that were employed at the Ogden Arsenal, um, in Clearfield, and other areas around there. Um, so they had this need for jobs in northern Utah. You had a lot of men who were being taken from northern Utah's job force to fight in the war, uh, and so, so immigration was needed to fit these needs. And so the Utah's total population grew by 25% during the decade of the war, uh, with people coming in to work in these wartime industries uh, to participate in this effort. Um, and the majority of these were concentrated along the Wasatch Front, especially around Hill Air Force Base, Weber, and Davis counties. Uh, and this raised up an issue, though, because where these people live, uh, because the towns themselves were prepared for this huge influx of, of new arrivals. Uh, and so they created new subdivisions uh, to house these workers, and there were five developments in northern Utah uh, from this time. There was Arsenal Villa in Roy, uh, Sahara Village in Layton, Verdland Park in Layton, Harrisville Heights in North Ogden, and Washington Terrace in Ogden. Um, a lot of these areas were created from former agricultural farmland uh, that was purchased by the United States government. Uh, and these houses that were built there were not very nice. Um, they were very much more similar to barracks than they are to houses. Um, and after the war, a lot of these homes actually were converted into single family homes. So if you drive through these areas, you can actually see these homes still in existence. Uh, and they have a very kind of modular build. They're very long. Uh, they have, they're very rectangular. And they all look exactly the same. And that's the reason why, was because they were built by the government. Yes, could you repeat the, the villages? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Arsenal. Slow down? Slow down? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Arsenal Villa up in Roy. Uh, Sahara Village in Layton. Uh, Verdland Park in Layton. Harrisville Heights in North Ogden. And Washington Terrace in Ogden. Yeah. Um, a lot of these areas are still in existence today. Most of them are neighborhoods within cities uh, that have taken them over. Washington Terrace is unique uh, because the citizens there had a fairly antagonistic relationship with the city of Ogden. Uh, the mayor of Ogden at the time described them as the slums of Ogden, uh, which, they, which they did not take kindly to. Um, and it was the same mayor that actually made the Pioneer Day celebration up there, so I guess he was kind of hit and miss. Um, <laughs> and so after the war, uh, the citizens of Washington Terrace uh, were able to make a referendum where they decided that they were going to be their own town, which they still are to this day. Um, but these cities fell, filled really quickly, um, and they really swelled the populations of the, of the towns. Verdland Park once held half the population of the city of Layton, um, which is really interesting because it was very concentrated. Verdland Park was in a very compact area, and so everyone in Layton was, half of the people in Layton were focused around this point. Um, and Alyssa will talk a little bit more about that, but before the war, Layton was about 626 people. Um, and then after the war, it really grew really fast, um, thanks to Verdland Park and the jumps there. Uh, these wartime cities were very diverse because people were coming from all over the nation to work in these wartime industries. 
Um, we ha I have some quotes here from uh, a woman who was a child in Washington Terrace at the time. Uh, she, she was part of our interviews uh, as part of our series. And she said, people in Washington Terrace came from all over the country to work in the war effort, so we just had about every religion imaginable there. Um, and of course, as a child, she remembers the Boy Scout troops. Um, there, were, <laughs> there was a surprisingly large amount of Boy Scout troops in Washington Terrace uh, because each church, each congregation sponsored their own and they didn't like to cooperate with each other. Um, but it was mostly a peaceful coexistence. She didn't really remember any sort of conflict between the LDS and the native LDS and the non-LDS immigrant kids. Um, she made some friends there who came in from Minnesota. And just to put it in perspective, she recalled she had a friend who came in from Minnesota uh, where they grew up in a, a more rural area. And when coming into Washington Terrace, his mother was just shocked to see uh, that they didn't have an outhouse. That they actually had an indoor toilet. So these were actually fairly state-of-the-art homes when they were built. Um, but some of the worst aspects of American culture remained in these new developments. Uh, segregation uh, was still a major factor. Uh, she remembered that there was a court in Washington Terrace, the, the streets were called courts, uh, called G Court. It was designated as Negro Court. And all the African Americans would live in that court. They'd be sent there. That's where they would get their housing. Um, and uh, there were some exceptions to this rule. Alyssa will talk about one particular exception um, in her presentation. But as a rule, there was segregation in these new communities. Um, so moving on from that military movement, Utah's location being where it is and being along the railroad routes made it a major hub for the military because uh, to ship troops from California to New York for deployment to Europe, he had to cross through Utah. To ship troops from New York to California for service in Japan, he had to cross through Utah. Um, and so Ogden's status as crossroads of the West was reaffirmed by this war. Um, and the number of troops moving through Utah really impressed civilians. Uh, one woman we interviewed remembered seeing the troops going by, sitting in her backyard by the railroad tracks, and just seeing the soldiers leaning out of the windows, waving at them, just huge numbers of men being transported across the face of the of northern Utah. Uh, and, and Union Station in particular was the main hub for this, uh, being the center of Ogden rail traffic at the time. Uh, and this was a boon for the rail industry in Ogden because during the Great Depression leading up to the war, uh, the rail industry had taken some major hits. So this was able to bring new employment to civilians in Ogden as well. Uh, but during the height of the war, there were as many as 120 trains that would pass through Union Station a day. Um, and six, uh, half of those, roughly half, would be passenger trains full of soldiers, full of personnel. And so just the numbers that they had had to deal with were staggering. Um, and so it put a huge strain on the existing rail networks. So new lines had to be built um, within the depot itself to help handle this increase in rail traffic. And that would help Union Station after the war. Uh, for the brief period, it remained a major crossroad. Um, and it was also a... Uh, played a sadder role. Uh, Union Station acted as a depot for wounded soldiers who were being transferred to Bushnell Military Hospital up in Brigham City. Brigham City. Brigham City. There we go. I wanted to say that they were in, in Layton, but I knew that was wrong. Um, it's Brigham City. Other direction. Um, and it was also, sadly, a, a processing station for the remains of soldiers that were killed on the front and their bodies were shipped back home to, to be distributed back home. Uh, to help facilitate this movement, uh, the Red Cross in Ogden set up a canteen. Uh, canteens were set up in many train stations during the war, um, but the one in Ogden was really unique because of just the sheer number of troops that are moving through. It also provided a way for civilian women uh, whose sons were maybe serving overseas uh, to participate in the war effort in a way that they felt that they could kind of bring a touch of home, as Lori Renz has put it in her paper on the subject, or to kind of reach out and have these surrogate sons that they could care for, um, who were going to face the same struggles that their own sons were facing. And it became a massive effort because at the height, it started off pretty slowly, uh, just with the war building up. But at the height, the canteen served a thousand soldiers a day, roughly a thousand. Uh, they'd give them coffee, donuts, people would bring in baked goods to donate, people would bring in cakes on their sons' birthdays so that they could share it with these soldiers. Uh, it became a kind of a human touch in this very inhuman time. And then POWs. So as the war continued um, and the Axis started falling back, the large amounts of German and Italian prisoners of war would come into the Allied hands. A lot of these would end up in Great Britain and the United Kingdom, uh, but that island had been so bombed and so devastated during the war that the United States decided to help its, its ally and start taking soldiers uh, to house within our, our state. 
um, and within the United States. So they were ended up taking almost half a million access prisoners of war, um, and 15,000 of those would be held in Utah, which if you think about it, it's like the perfect place to store people if you don't want them to get away, because if they, <laughs> they try to run away that way, it's the mountains. If they try to run away that way, it's the desert. So really, it's perfect. It's, Kind of, kind of an awful place, actually. If you think about it. But, um, <laughs> I mean, if I was an Italian, I would, I would not like being in Utah. Um, but they would be scattered in eleven installations throughout the state, um, some of which be on Utah. But five of these would be centered in northern Utah, um, which was important because uh, these POWs would end up serving a role in the war work effort. Uh, because of the jobs that were being created, uh, more jobs were being created than we had civilians to man them. And so prisoners of war would end up working. Um, thousands ended up working at Hill Field, and these were in a variety of jobs. They ranged from janitorial work uh, to work on assembly lines. Um, they also worked on local farms that were having problems finding hired hands to fill their positions. Um, and just so that they could help free up more men for the war effort. Uh, and interactions between the locals and the POWs vary greatly depending on if you were an Italian or if you were a German. Germans received the blame for the war um, because of Hitler invading Poland, which tr triggered the whole thing. Um, and they were also still fighting actively up till the end of the war. And so Germans were viewed with a little bit more hostility and mistrust by locals. Um, but Italians. Um, <laughs> Were, were not viewed as unfavorably. Um, Ital Italy ended up switching sides towards the end of the war um, and ended up being on the Allied side towards the end um, after they overthrew Mussolini. Um, and so after that point, the Italian prisoners of war, who were now technically our allies, uh, were given a lot more opportunities to go out in the town, uh, to go to dance clubs. Uh, to participate in social activities. Uh, people could invite them into their homes for Sunday dinner. Um, and they ended up having a lot more, kind of it was like a vacation for a lot of them. Uh, a lot of the Italian soldiers were, the Italian soldiers during the tail end of the war were notorious for low morale. And so they were able to kind of recover some of that in the prisoner of war camp, which is kind of what you think the opposite of what should happen. But that's, that's what ended up happening. Um, and so as the war came to a close, preparations were made to send them back to their home countries. Several Italians didn't want to go because they ended up kind of had some, made some friends. <laughs> yeah, especially with young women. Um, but they had to go. Uh, there were some exceptions, though. Some people ended up coming back uh, from Italy to settle in Ogden and other parts of northern Utah after the war because their experience have been so positive in a prisoner of war camp. Um, <laughs> most of the Germans, however, did not want to come back. Um, they ended up having a very bad experience um, when they were sent back because they were relatively well treated compared to other prisoner of war camps in Utah. Um, we did have one unfortunate incident uh, down in central Utah where there was a massacre. Yeah. Uh, a, a guard kind of went off the rails and attacked some prisoners. Um, it was the only major attack on prisoners during the war. Kind of a black spot on Utah during that. Uh, but in northern Utah, at least, there wasn't any incident like that. Uh, but the Germans would end up being shipped back to processing stations in the United Kingdom and in France. And those two countries had very low opinions of Germans after the war. Um, and so several of them would end up starving to death or dying of mistreatment at the hands of their processing stations right before they were supposed to go home. Um, and not, none of the German prisoners were, as far as we could tell, ended up coming back, or very few did. And then, just to brief, touch briefly on Japanese internment, um, Utah played a role in that national tragedy, again, because Utah is a perfect place for a prison, because uh, of the desert and because of the mountains. And the internment camp at Topaz ended up hosting around 10,000 Japanese Americans deported from the west coast of the United States. And that's a staggeringly large amount of Americans, most of them citizens, that were shipped away. Um, and a lot of them ended up losing their property and livelihoods during the war because they were only allowed to bring certain, very few possessions with them. Um, and of course, their job works would, work wouldn't hold their jobs for them and their homes would go up for sale. And so a lot of them lost their lives on the West Coast. And so many would end up settling in the Intermountain West. Um, unfortunately, some settled, had to settle as uh, itinerant farmers um, because even though, if, even if they had specialized job training because very few people wanted to hire a Japanese after the war. Uh, so that's kind of a, another dark, dark moment in our nation's history and also Utah's history because of this. Uh, so to conclude my section of this, uh, Northern Utah acting as the crossroads of the West, 
Uh, it was uniquely positioned to handle and to benefit from the changes brought by World War II. Uh, we were able to expand our population, create new jobs, um, and help make Northern Utah a much more modern industrial place in the United States. And I'll turn my time over to Melissa. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, so as he mentioned, I'm going, going to just kind of um, pick up a little bit of um, more of the cultural influences of World War II, um, how the movement of World War II diversified Utah, uh, made it a little more economically sound, and um, made us more prepared for a more modern age as well. Um, I'm going to, oh, let me go ahead and move this here. Um, I'm especially going to look into victory housing, um, military installations, and the changing demographics of Utah, and let you know what expanded, what stayed, and how it influenced us. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about Birdland Park. Um, it was um, it was there from 1943 to 1964. Um, so as Michael uh, said, it was located just outside of Layton. Originally, it was built uh, between 1942 and 1943. It consisted of 400 housing units. Uh, the residents that lived there mainly worked at Hillfield and Clearfield Naval Supply Depot. Uh, the first daycare center was actually um, started there, uh, the first daycare started center in northern Utah. Um, and then Birdland Park Elementary School opened in 1943. Uh, the significance behind that is that in 1965, it became the first school in Davis County to have an integrated um, staff when they hired on Mrs. Ruby T. Price, who was African American. Um, by the end of 1943, Birdland Park boasted 14, or sorry, 1,440 residents, which doubled the population of Layton City. Um, as Michael mentioned, in 1940, the population of Layton City was 646 people, and by 1950, Layton's population was up to 3,456 people, which is a 435% increase. And I heard those numbers, I thought, that's got to be fake, but no, this is true. It's amazing. Um, so as a result of the population boom, Main Street was widened and the city's first traffic signal was installed in 1943 at Main Street in Gentile. At the end of World War II, Verdland Park was run by Layton City as a rental unit and then in 1964 it was dismantled and it's now the site of Layton Commons Park, uh, Layton City offices and the grounds of Layton High School. Uh, next is Washington Terrace. Uh, so it was built to meet the demands of the rapidly um, increasing civilian workforce at Hill Air Force Base. Construction started mid-1942 and ended early 1943. Uh, it included 1,400 temporary two-bedroom houses and it was located four miles just right outside of downtown, downtown, downtown Ogden. Not Downton Abbey, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the Federal Works Agency provided the funds for this, and our very own Leslie S. Hodgson was the architect, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, it spanned 250 acres and cost approximately $8 million. After the war wrapped up around 1947, uh, Washington Terrace was put up for sale, but the residents of Washington Terrace pulled together and they came up with the Washington Terrace Nonprofit Housing Corporation, which made it possible for them to basically buy it out and help it become a city. Um, and on November 4th, 1958, it officially became a city and graduated from being an Ogden suburb. And today, the city boasts around 10,000 occupants. All right, next we have war work installations. Um, so as Michael kind of touched on before, um, Ogden boasted 14 military installations, which provided war work jobs to 40,000 civilians, which is massive. Um, the main installations that we featured in our exhibit were Hillfield, Ogden Arsenal, Defense Depot Ogden, and Clearfield Naval Supply Depot. Oh, and I wanted to mention too, since I have a lot of pictures, if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to, add, to raise your hand, even if I need to repeat something. Um, don't feel bad about that. So first we're going to talk about, oh yes, please. My parents worked at the Arsenal. Oh, no kidding. And I can remember going to the Arsenal uh, the field, and they had a theater, uh, and then going to uh, 
up there to uh, at Christmas time and get a little package from Santa Claus. Uh, I, I remember that very well. Thank you for sharing. That's a great memory. I appreciate that. So we're going to talk a little bit about Hillfields. Um, Hillfield started as an Army Air Mail Depot in 1934. And then in July 1939, Congress um, ap appropriated $8 million for the construction of the Ogden Air Depot. Um, it was still under, under Army, um, not because Air Force wasn't created yet. In 1939, it was named Hill Field in honor of Major Ployer Peter Hill. And the groundbreaking ceremony was July 12, 1940. Um, by November, uh, it had the arrival of its first commando commander, which was Colonel Morris Berman, and in World War II, it was mainly used as a maintenance and supply base for aircraft. Um, it would, they would uh, bring the aircraft there to be fixed up and then returned back to combat. Um, at the height of wartime activity, which was 1943, it had over 22,000 military and civilian personnel working there. In 1944, it became a long-term storage for surplus aircraft and support equipment. And by the end of 1947, more than $200 million worth of aircraft had been preserved in near-perfect condition for, per for future use. So that's an amazing amount. On September 26, 1947, the Army Air Corps became the U.S. Air Force, Air Force and on February 5, 1948, Hillfield became Hill Air Force Base and uh, switched from the Army to the Air Force. Today, Hill Air Force Base is Utah's largest employer and it employs two, or sorry, 23,000 employees, um, including 13,000 civilians and 4,700 military personnel. Did you have something? No, I'm just Oh, alright, sorry. <laughs> but I will have it later on. Oh, please do. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, next is Ogden Arsenal. So it was originally built in 1920 to store excess ammunition from World War I. Um, during World War II, it produced various calibers of ammunition and bombs up to 2,000 pounds. Uh, 1942 it includes this, uh, included the storage of combat vehicles, and the workforce grew to 6,000 personnel. Mostly were, uh, most of them were women, in fact, because as we know, the men were off fighting. In June 1946, the workforce dropped to 1,500 people. In the years following World War II, the arsenal served mainly as a collection depot for reserve materials and storage for uh, tanks, amphibious land and landing crafts, um, half tracks, and other army vehicles. The arsenal was reactivated during the Korean War, and in 1955 it combined with the Ogden Air Material era, Area, which actually caused Hill Air Force Base to almost double in size. Clearfield Naval Supply Depot is one of only three naval supply depots in the U.S. during World War II. It was set up to buy and ship equipment and supplies and to handle the movement of personnel. Um, Clearfield Naval Supply Depot covered the West Coast, uh, three of the West Coast points, and served the Pacific Fleet. It cost about $37 million to build um, and opened in 1943 with 8,000 civilian employees. At its peak in 1944, it received 2.5 million tons of material and shipped half that amount around the clock, making it the largest naval supply depot in the world by the end of World War II. It's pretty impressive, guys. To help with manpower shortages, um, oh yes, please. Uh, Kate, I grew up uh, northwest of the base. Oh. And I can remember hearing tacks. And there's two things. The reason it was based where it was to get away from the West Coast, and uh, if uh, the enemy, you know, it was too far in the in the states for them to, you know, bomb it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one thing that nobody brought up is that the tracks from Promontory was used there for the uh, base. Oh, the I actually did not know that. Oh. oh, there you go. We're getting there. We have the professional to end this kid. No, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I actually didn't know that, so I'm looking forward to hearing about that. 
So to help with the manpower shortages, uh, Italian POWs were employed there um, in 1943. The waves were also employed there for a little while to help. Um, it served as the depository for the personal effects of the Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines who were serving overseas, uh, and that's both uh, missing in action as well as those who just happened to lose their personal effects. Um, as a result, the Clearfield Naval Supply Depot was in charge of contacting next of kin or um, the military themselves to find how to get to the rightful owners. Um, after the war, the Clearfield Naval Supply Depot continued uh, in use until 1962 when uh, providing support through the Korean War and providing thousands of jobs to Northern Utahns. Uh, final installation is Defense Depot Ogden, also called DDO, which is what I'm going to refer to it as from now on. Um, on September 19th, uh, sorry, yep, September 19th, 1941, DDO was built on what was formerly uh, 1,700 acres of pasture and farmland, and it included eight warehouses. Um, it received, stored, maintained food, clothing, textiles, petroleum products, pressured gas, pressurized gases, and general supplies for medical, industrial, construction, and electronic uses. So it was very multifaceted. It served as a POW camp for both German and Italian POWs. And at its peak, it employed 4,000 civilians and 5,000 POWs. Um, it also expanded to 20 warehouses from its original eight, and it shipped 200 boxcars a day. It was the largest wartime quartermaster depot in the U.S. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, I'm sorry, but oh, please. It, it was all called, also called at one time Utah General Depot. Oh, yeah, that's right. I kind of skipped over some of the oh. transformation, but I, I, felt, or, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it handled more supplies than the other three northern Utah de depots combined, and it stayed in service through the Cold War and finally closed its doors in 1997. So that's quite the staying power right there. Uh, next is, I wanted to cover changing demographics. Um, Michael kind of covered a little bit about the POWs who came back, and I am actually really fascinated by this because there were um, a decent amount of POWs who came back and married the women here, like you were saying. Mostly Italian, but they're actually, I do know of one instance of a German POW coming back. Um, so I'll go ahead and tell you those stories now. So the two on the edges um, are both Italian. Um, on the left is, let me see if I can remember their names here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so on the left is Joe and Beth Giordano, and on the right is Joe and Cleon Battisti. Battisti? Batisti? Okay. I always slaughter the names after I look to Sarah. <laughs> um, so both were part of the Italian service unit um, after Ita Italy had um, kind of a, what's the right word for that? Not quit the war. Surrendered. Surrendered. Thank you so much. Um, and they both met their future wives at the DDO where they were working. Um, I love their stories because they talk a bit about how those the women and the Italians had to work side by side and as nature has it, they were attracted to each other and there was that colliding of cultures there that lasted. Um, a lot of them came back to Utah, including these two, um, to marry these women. And uh, Joe Giordano especially um, started Giordano Excavation here in Ogden in 1971, uh, which is still owned and run by his son, Randy. I thought that was kind of cool. The center photo is of Eric and Eleanor uh, Kososik? Kososik? Kososik. Kososik. There we go. Um, Eric was a German POW um, who was stationed here at the DDO during the war. And he was sent back to Germany after the war, but he actually brought back his, his new wife from Germany and also their two children in 1952. And um, they worked some odd jobs for a few years until Eric started his own business out here. It was uh, Eric's, let's see, Eric's Repair Service. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Eleanor mentioned how uh, there was some skepticism from the Americans when they came back. Um, she even heard one man say, what are the Germans coming back for? Are they gonna start another war? Mm -hmm. But she was saying that she was willing to work hard and that there were a lot of kind people along the way who helped them as well. <laughs> uh, another changing demographic as a result of, yes, please. No, don't be sorry. What? Can you take it back? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, the picture on the right. Yes. Uh, 
uh, I'm deep in military history. And the picture on the right, she just passed away the first of the year. Cleon. Cleon. Yes. Yeah. Are you, are you going to talk about it? No, I mean, no, cut. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah, no, no, yeah, but she, yes, yeah, she did just pass away. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and the only one that's still living is Beth. Mm -hmm. Oh. On um, the left. Yeah. Cleon, her husband Joe passed away in 76, um, and so did Beth's husband passed away. Um, Eric passed away in 2001, and then Eleanor passed away two years ago. So. Uh, it's, uh, that picture is in a, a military. Uh, yes. It's not Facebook, but a uh, uh, book Oh. So it's very great. Yes. It's, yes. It's a great photo. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It has Italy on his arm, so you can tell right. he's one of the POWs there. Um, yeah, and actually, Eleanor also mentioned how Eric wanted to come back because he loved the atmosphere of Ogden so much. He loved the mountains. He loved the people. So I thought that was really fascinating as well. Um, another cha changing demographic was women in the workforce, which is one of my personal favorites, of course. Um, with so many men going off to war, women were obviously needed in a lot of these wartime jobs and so attitudes about women and their capabilities started changing and I wish I would have put this propaganda poster up there but there's one of a man sitting by a woman and he says good job sister I didn't know you could do a man-sized job it makes me laugh every time <laughs> but <laughs> one of the women that we that we uh, interviewed was was Laprille Looney and she was a wartime employee at Hillfield and she said most of the women at Hillfield were taking whatever jobs were needed a lot of them had no knowledge of what was going on, but they learned and they worked hard. It changed the way women were accepted in the workforce. Before the war, women were never allowed to go into a higher job. But when it became necessary, and when people found out that women could do it, that really made a difference for women everywhere to get better jobs. She also mentioned how when she first started her job at Hill Air Force Base, she had no idea how to do the job. Um, but she learned just through on-the-job training, through observation, and that was what happened with a lot of women. And they were admired for their perseverance, their hard work, and their gumption as they took on these jobs that they had no training for. Finally, I wanted to cover a little bit about the aftermath of Topaz. Um, uh, Michael kind of covered a little bit about the statistics of Topaz. As he said, there were about 10,000 Japanese Americans who um, were forced to go to Topaz. Um, and actually about a thousand of them stayed after the war, which was interesting and made a lot of contributions to the northern Utah culture. Um, one of the women that we interviewed was Alice um, Harai, is that how you say her name? Harai. And she was a child when she and her family were brought to Topaz, and she has a few memories of it. Um, what One of the things that she was saying was that Topaz housed a lot of people from the San Francisco Bay Area, which at the time was the headquarters for the Buddhist Churches of America. And once all those people were brought from the San Francisco Bay Area up to Topaz, Topaz became the um, headquarters of the Buddhist Churches of America, um, which is really interesting. Because of that, there's a lot more Buddhist influence in um, Utah, and uh, she remembers how a lot of the things that she learned, a lot of the cultural celebrations that she learned in Topaz stayed up here as a result of that influence, wartime influence. Oh dear, I didn't realize I went back to women in the workforce. Sorry about that. Anyway, in conclusion, I just wanted to um, mention again how World War II and the movement, um, the exchange of culture, made northern Utah a lot more culturally enriched. Uh, it prepared us for the modern age and it strengthen our economy in ways that have lasted until today. Thank you. So I'll just take a second as I get mine up and ready. So again, my name is Annie Kitterman. I am the Cultural Resource Manager at Hill Air Force Base, which means I manage um, all our cultural resources, including historic buildings, archeological sites, traditional cultural properties, 
all sorts of stuff. And it's about, if you include the range, which I also do about a million acres of land. Um, but we are going to talk about our largest archeological site um, today, which is the railroad. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to try not to repeat too much yet, some of my same facts, but that's great. So, um, as was mentioned, Ogden Arsenal was chosen as a site to store excess munitions from World War I. So I'm going to start a little bit before World War II, because that's when we got started. Um, it was chosen primarily due to its locations, as was said, to the crossroads of the West. It was all about the railroad, and that's why it was chosen. Um, it also has very sandy soil. Um, and if you're storing munitions, munitions, especially at that point in time, had a tendency to explode. So they wanted something that could help absorb it. So it was also, we talked about all the buildings or all the neighborhoods and stuff coming in. When it was first there, it was remote. There was really nothing within at least a mile of the area. And so with all of those things combined, it made an ideal place as well as being, they wanted something um, not just East Coast, not just West Coast, but again, centralized to prevent um, potential attacks. Excuse me. Um, as was mentioned, actually, yeah, one of the very cool facts is that some of the rail was brought directly from um, the Transcontinental Continental Railroad to start that, um, to start the rail. It began with a purchase of 1,500 acres, um, and at that point in time was the Ogden Ordnance Reserve Depot which was then renamed the Ogden Arsenal in 1942. It was initially allotted to hold about 10% of the World War I munitions. Um, it was begun in 1920, but was completed in 1921. So most of our few, very few remaining buildings from that time are from that time frame. It included initially 35 magazines, an administration building, a warehouse, two repacking houses, a machine shop, and a locomotive house, and that's what you see pictured up there. It was the original locomotive house. Um, everything built that was needed for building those structures was brought by rail. So guess what was built first? <laughs> the rail was the first thing that was part of Ogden, um, the Ogden Arsenal. Later, many, many names. The DOD loves to rename things. Um, eventually, what is now Hill Air Force Base. Um, Originally, the locomotive shop was built just for infrastructure for ammunition storage, and it was one of the few buildings that survived um, 1929 tornado force winds um, that decimated all but five of the magazines and two structures, which includes this building and the Hobson House, which was the administration house of the, or administration building at that time. Um, in around 1935, the locomotive shop began to maintain and repair army-owned locomotives. Um, as well as function as the hub for munitions. So its mission began to change a little bit. So the arsenal. Um, during its transition years, it started to decline, um, especially after that 1929 storm when almost everything was decimated. Um, at the same time, munitions, the munitions that were stored there, were um, classed as obsolete in excess. So the depot kind of really wasn't functioning anymore and was almost um, basically taken from the system. Um, that included the rail. At that point in time, a lot of the lines started rusting. Things were growing up. It was becoming in a state of decay. That was until 1935. And at that point in time, um, due to the mobilization regulations that were coming out, which called for an increase in production of munitions due to the looming threat in Europe, as well as the Japanese, Japanese aggression in China, the depot's purpose changed, um, and the arsenal went from just storing munitions to manufacturing them. So the existence ordna ordnance facilities um, around the US were upgraded to munition producing facilities. And as was mentioned, the Works Progress Administration provided the funding, um, but also interesting is the Ogden Chamber of Commerce um, acquired nearly 4,300 acres of additional land for the government to buy. Oh. So Ogden got a great deal of it, <laughs> got a great deal out of it, but it also provided the needed land to expand. Um, 
1936, the groundbreaking occurred, um, specifically at a new bomb loading plant um, and the construction of 115 um, new munitions igloos were started. Um, eight powder magazines were also begun to be built at that time. So as you can imagine, when more buildings go up, so does more rail. And at that point in time, um, the railroad began to, it's one of its first steps to expansion and went to about 10 miles of rail. I just need to focus. There we go. Um, so it was at this time that the Ogden Arsenal was re or the depot was renamed the Ogden Arsenal, um, and that was between, uh, or I said, as I said earlier, 1942. Um, and that railroad continued to grow. So by 1941, 20 additional miles had been constructed, and 12 more were pending. Um, this only continued to, to expand. By 1942, a new locomotive shop or repair shop had been constructed and the railroad's operation assets jumped to over 100 pieces. This included um, flat cars, tankers, box cars, and passenger cars. It provided 24-hour service, worked with as many as nine crews, and the monthly movement averaged between eight to 13,000 cars. So it was pretty big. And the map that you see here, pretty much all of those lines are what the rail were during the World War II eras. Did the government own the railroad and the locomotives? Or did the government and the The government, it was Army at that point in time. So the Army owned the railroad? Yeah, the the railroad everything railroad. on the installation was Army owned. Um, so some of the other interesting things that happened is um, a lot of the lines, um, all of the munitions bunkers were actually served by an individual line, and some even had a little kind of runoff spur from that line as well. But all the munitions bunkers were both built lower in the ground, and so had sloped ramps to them. Um, because that got tricky maneuvering by hand, which is how they had been doing it, um, they actually came up with an ingenious way, and we've got a couple photos here, of creating a conveyor track that transferred munitions directly from the rail cars to the inside of the igloo. And so instead of having to lift things up and down, <laughs> they were able to just directly put it in. And as you can imagine, that not only saved time, but was a lot safer to do. <laughs> um, at this point in time in 1942, the Transportation Depot Maintenance Division also opened, which was an army organization that performed all the rail maintenance for bases around the US. The arsenal then became a major repair center for railroad equipment. Oh, sorry, um, and um, allowed vehicle or vehicles, trains to carry arms and munitions to all sorts of ports of embarkation. It also led to a shortage of its workers. We're hearing with even with the influx of people coming in, there was a shortage of workers um, on both the mechanical and right-of-way sides of the railroad house. One reported bottleneck included 245 cars which were loaded and waiting for shipment but could not get out because they still had trains coming in. So again, the installation was booming at this point in time. Um, by 1943, the arsenal was one of the busiest shipping centers in the Western US and was processing, as we, I think he said, about a million pounds of freight um, on a daily basis. At its height, the rail, rail transportation branch of the arsenal was operating over 108 miles of track. Unfortunately, we don't know where all that track is. We have records that it was there. My guess is a lot of it is stuff that is now off installation, but was part of the arsenal originally. So we talked about the original locomotive house. <laughs> um, this was the new um, engine repair shop that was built in 1942. The shop included seven stalls for locomotives and a 10-ton overhead crane, which spanned two tracks that laid over a drop pit. Um, kind of to give you an idea of how much the growth of the arsenal and the use of um, the rail was, so rail was so critical during this time, was initially the engine repair shop solely served as the repair center for the 9th Transportation Division. However, by 1945, it also served the same capacity for the 4th, 7th, and 8th zones as well. So it took on a lot of additional work. Um, and it, uh, this 
complex, I guess you could say, because it's expanded, <laughs> um, still stands um, at the base. One of the other critical elements, one of the other big reasons that um, the arsenal was built where it was, was its um, location um, close to the Bamberger Railroad. And so the Bamberger Railroad um, was integral to basically everything that happened on the base because it was its main connection to the outside world. It provided all the freight service um, for things coming in and out and also provided pas passenger service. It was eventually replaced by the Union Pacific Rail. Um, during the height of production in World War II, the Bamberger operated an exclusive train for base employees who would be taken to the border um, of the installation. A car would be taken off and at what was called the Roy Junction and an arsenal engine would come and pull um, the train up onto base with all its passengers. And the building you see here is the um, old Bamberger stop for that passenger train. So the arsenal um, did extend beyond World War II. Um, and as was mentioned, it did have, it kind of went to a munitions storage originally, but did have a resurgence of activity in munitions production during the Korean War. Um, but after that, there was still a huge need for munitions storage, but uh, as we know, the hill field now was located um, next door, and so the arsenal could no longer expand. And it was decided at that time um, that the Air Force need for munitions storage um, as, as well as aircraft and missile development growth was a better fit for um, the area and so the DOD transferred the arsenal property to um, Hill Air Force Base. The one mission that did not move, however, was the rail and locomotive repair shop which again is still there and functioning to this day as a repair, or it's the only locomotive repair shop in the US. So the Ogden Air Depot. <laughs> um, at the same time, the arsenal was also ramping up for World War II. The Army Air Corps, which was formed in 1926, constructed installations across the country for national defense. In 1939 specifically, um, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt established um, the Ogden Air Depot and a portion of the air base um, was even being built on a section of Arsenal land. So I'm going to go back one. So these warehouses um, are actually from the Air Depot but are on Arsenal land. So our DOD agencies worked I think a little bit better together at that point in time. Um, so the majority of the construction on the newly formed airbase was completed by 1943, which included an expansion of railroad spur tracks from the arsenal to the air depot in order to expedite the movement of supplies. Additional rail was then constructed to plan warehouses, sheds, and, and an industrial area. So the air depot was running about 13.92 miles of track originally. Um, and was receiving about an average of 20 train card loads of material daily, and that was in 1941. By 1945, the, the track had expanded to 14.2 miles um, and was used primarily for the repair and overhaul, as was mentioned, of the aircraft, um, but it also transported supplies for the war effort. Um, by 1947, the importance of the installation as a supply base was clear, and it was demonstrated by the fact that there was still not enough personnel to move material from freight to cars to warehouses, resulting in a lot of open storage. And we've got some great pictures of munitions stored out in the snow in the middle of winter. Um, from June to August 1947 alone, more than 350 rail cars of plane parts and vehicles were sent from Hill, were sent, sorry, to Hill from just one other base, and that was the Fairchild Base up in Spokane, Washington. So from one, one single other base were 350 rail cars alone. Um, we already mentioned that in 1947, Hillfield was then officially renamed Hill Air Force Base. And so if we go, so if you look at this map, um, the red outline is what was Hillfield, and the blue line um, and darker gray line are the tracks that were located on Hillfield. 
Um, everything up above was still on Ogden Arsenal property at that point in time until the additional transfer. So the Ogden Air Depot had a little longer life um, than the Ogden Arsenal and continued a little bit longer due to the Cold War. Um, the rail system at this point in time was enlarged because of an increasing workload and from January to June of 1951, a total of 1,451 freight cars were received at Hill and 600 cars were shipped. Um, by 1951, excuse me, 1959, we know that 70.4 miles of rail existed on Hill Air Force Base, and that includes all the rail that was obtained from the Ogden Arsenal. Um, one of the critical things and why all of this was necessary was that Hill did play an important part in the development and storage of the Minuteman um, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM. Um, at the same time, other ICBMs, such as the Peacekeeper, were stored at Hill and transported via this network of rails. So everything you see um, on this is ICBMs being transported and stored. It was also a critical part of tests associated with the missiles, such as Operation Big Star, um, shown here on these photos. Um, Operation Big Star was a mobile test using four trains from Hill Air Force Base. The Strategic Air Commander, SAC, conducted tests of the Minuteman Missile Transport System to assure the missiles could be taken anywhere, at any time, um, on tracks that existed in the U.S. for launch. And the map actually shows you kind of the existing map they were using for rail lines at that point in time. And the, those are actually pictures of Operation Big Star test being conducted. So sadly, the rail did not last. Um, in the early 1970s and definitely by the end of the Vietnam War, the rail transport around the nation declined in favor of trucking. Creations of the interstate highway and improvements to roads um, led to trucking being a more efficient and cheaper route or means than transporting via rail. So this was no different for the base, um, and the use of the rail began a rapid decline at this time with only very large engines and other large equipment being transferred. So this is kind of how most of the rail looks at this point in time, if there's a remnant at all. Um, there are about 13, approximately 13 miles of intact rail still there, but only about six of that is actively being used, most in, a, most in conjunction with that. Um, the locomotive repair shop. So knowing that the rail was rapidly disappearing as well as that it was becoming a major safety factor, um, we had a lot of rail lines going in front of munition storage areas where people were having to drive forklifts over them. I don't know about any of you, but I wouldn't want to drive a forklift carrying munitions over rail. Um, our rail did have to be removed, a lot of our rail has continued to have to be removed. So in 2015, we contracted Sagebrush consultants to record the 63.5 miles of still existing rail as well as confirmed former rail. Again, we know that there were higher amounts of rail at times, but we haven't been able to clearly identify where all of that was. And again, from a little bit of my research, it looks like some of it is now off installation. The interesting thing about this is that we only have a little bit of rail itself left we were able to identify more than 200 features that were associated with the largely dismantled rail. So even though the rail wasn't there, a lot of the features still were. We also were, I just didn't have this in here, but we were able to find one or two pieces of line that were still tied to that promen <coughs> excuse wow. me, promontory time frame. Not many, most were a little bit later, um, but there were a few still lying about. They weren't actually intact, but they we had smiles. <laughs> So that is kind of the history of the rail and why it was so critical to Hill Air Force Base. So are there any questions for the three presenters? No, I've said too many things. Oh, you can. <laughs> Concerning the Hill Air Force munitions, what, what became of all those like World War One munitions, World War Two? Did they have a program of uh, destroying those munitions or reuse them, or how, what happened and all that stuff? Yeah, there were a few things. Um, 
when the, when the installation was closed, a lot of them were trans, um, transferred to other um, installations. Um, but the Air Force has actively destroyed them as well, and Army had this procedure of doing the same. Um, in fact, if you go out to our range, <laughs> um, one of the, we, the, I think there's not just the EOD danger from, um, from the tests and the active training that happens, but they find these old stockpiles of where they went and blew them up, <laughs> but they didn't always blow up. <laughs> and so some of that still um, is out there. But I think for the most part, a lot of it was at that point trying was transferred away to other installations. So, and after that, I did it. That's Army history. <laughs> and there's also big storage depot in Tooele, right, Army depot? Yes. Yep. Is that still active or is that? It is, no, it's still active. Yep, we work with them. Anything else? Oh, right. sorry. No? Uh, no, it's so progress that it's losing history. And we, uh, we appreciate all your work uh, to bring this information to us. Oh, it oh it's so intriguing. <laughs> but I was going to say, one of the things I didn't mention is because we are losing rail, one of our requirements as a federal agency is we have to do what is called mitigating an adverse effect. So because we are going to have to com continue to remove rail, that mitigation, part of it was um, a pamphlet that talks about the historic rail, and I did bring some copies of that in the back. So feel free to grab one as you go out. Um, we also have some copies that we found buried of our From Arms to Aircraft, which is a really good um, and brief history of both the Arsenal and Hillfields. Um, so take copies if for some reason when we run out, let me know, because um, I can always forward digital or hard copies as well. But yeah, it is. It's one of those, that's one of the things when I came in, um, unfortunately the archeologist before me was not a historic archeologist uh -oh. and the rail had kind of been overlooked. So I was glad when I came in that we were able to do as much recordation. And again, find as many associated features. It, that was one of the things that really surprised me is we found a lot of the story still there. It was just not in the form of rail. All right, well, can we thank our presenters one more time?